starting a new series today, and uh, some of you know we, we talked about it last week, but it's this series over here that we're calling Fear. Fear. And, and I think that uh, we, said, we said on the Facebook page, and I think this is true, if there was ever a summer in the world to have fear, this is it. Isn't it amazing how many fears we've now stacked up on top of each other? I want you to think back to the beginning of the pandemic and like how scared you were to put your foot out the door to like think that like little coronaviruses were waiting for you to come out your door and come get you, right? And, and I think everybody kind of had that reaction at the beginning and then we're like, yeah, I can, I can take another step. Oh, I can take another two steps. Oh, wow, well, I can get all the way to the street. Um, and, and so that was scary. And, and then, you know, over the last few weeks, you know, just the, 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 the rash of, of protests and, and violence and things like that has, has been difficult, both on people who, who are on the receiving end and people who are on the giving end and, and people who are on the protesting end. And, and like everybody's, there could be anything that could happen at any time. Like, I, I don't remember a time in my life where I'm like, I could, you know, simultaneously get my church broken into by, by people. I could simultaneously get uh, coronavirus and die. I could simultaneously, you know, have all the other normal things that could have happened to me before also happen to me. Like, there's so many ways that I could get hurt right now. And there's so many ways that my family members, the people I love, and my, my grandpa, and my grandma, and all, all the people that, that I love, that, that we are all in danger, right? And, and we've always all been in danger. Like, that's the reality of life, that we're always kind of all in danger. But it just feels so much more visceral, right? So I'd, I'd like to I'd like to think during this series about how we experience fear. What is an appropriate and, and a Christian version of fear, and what is not? And we're going to spend a lot of time thinking about that. And so I'm hoping that maybe it looks a little bit different when you read fear and you see the boogeyman uh, or the Abu Shawaba who eats you if you don't uh, go to bed on time. Um, if, if any of those like images come to your mind when you think about fear, I hope that we change your mindset around kind of how we think about fear. Because in the Bible, fear is sometimes good and sometimes bad, and we want to have the right kind of fear and not the wrong kind of fear. And so I want to start with a very simple exercise. Don't worry, not physical exercise. I'm not going to make you sweat. I want you to close your eyes, whether you're at home or outside or, um, or you're here in the sanctuary, I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to think to yourself, what does God look like? So I want you to think about God. Close your eyes and think about God. And I want you to see what image pops up for you. If you've got the live stream open, I want you to just put that comment into the comment stream. Let us know what comes into your mind when you think about God. All right, anybody who's in the room, just really quickly, what came into your mind? Like one or two words. What came into your mind when you when you tried to visualize God? What's the first thing that popped up? An old man on the throne. An old man on the throne. Anybody else? A gray-haired hippie. A gray-haired hippie. That's interesting. Jesus on the cross. Okay, anybody else? A bright light. No? Okay. My mother. Your mother. Anybody else got a, got a picture that came to their mind when you, when you tried to visualize God? An old guy hugging a parent. An old guy hugging a I like that. Don't squeeze it too hard. The volcanoes are explode. Um, okay. So it's, isn't it interesting how like we all have this like idea of who God is in our brain? I, I want to pull that apart a little bit this week. As we think about God, we think about an appropriate amount of fear. So let's turn with me, if you would, we're going to turn to Proverbs chapter 9. Proverbs chapter 9, if, you, if you're here in the sanctuary, it's going to be up on the screen. If you're at home or if you're on the patio or the arbor, um, we've got this cool thing called the Weird Paper. And uh, there's a link to it in the comment section if you're online or if you're outside. Um, one of your hosts has it. Um, and it has the scripture passage on it, so if you don't have a, a, a phone that's got the Bible on it, um, you're totally welcome to use that. Um, and so go ahead and, and pull that up if you've got it. We're going to go to Proverbs chapter 9. Um, and we're going to read for Proverbs. Now, 
Proverbs violates all of my rules usually about um, preaching because I always tell you don't listen to anybody who preaches out of one verse or a half verse because you can make one verse or a half verse say anything you want. Um, always listen to people who preach out of like three to four verses at a time. Proverbs is like the one exception to that rule because there are some parts of those verses that are like a half verse and that like has nothing to do with the next half of the verse. Uh, Proverbs is like very quick hitting versions of, of wisdom. It's, it's Solomon's wisdom. Solomon, who had a thousand wives, um, and uh, but somehow was also so wise. He got he asked God for the gift. I don't I don't know how that works. That's TBD. Um, but Solomon, if you know the story of Solomon, Solomon was the son of David, and David was such a powerful character. David was somebody that even though he failed and he failed very publicly and very boldly, he asked for forgiveness. And, and God loved him, and he loved God, and, and nobody in the history of Israel other than Jesus has the kind of respect that David does. They even call Jerusalem the city of David. It's still to this day the Israeli flag is the star of David. David is highly respected. So when David dies, he has a son named Solomon, and Solomon comes to the throne, and God says to Solomon, Solomon, I'll give you anything that you want. Anything that you want. What do you want? Solomon thinks about it, and he says, I want wisdom. I want wisdom. And God loved that he asked for that. He didn't ask for riches or land or anything like that. He wanted wisdom. And so, and so it was well known that Solomon was one of the wisest people in, in the world. And people came from far and near to hear about his wisdom. But he wrote these Proverbs, and these are supposed to be the collection of his wisdom. And Proverbs chapter 9 is this amazing thing where he talks about how wisdom is transferred from one person to another. How we understand and become wise. Here's how it goes. Wisdom has built her house. She has set up its seven pillars. Isn't it interesting? He makes wisdom a she. Yeah. <laughs> Women, you know why. Men, you know why even more. <laughs> um, she has prepared her meat and mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her servants and she calls from the highest point of the city. Let all those who are simple come to my house. To those who have no sense, she says, come eat my food and drink the wine that I have mixed. Leave your simple ways and you will live. Walk in the way of insight. Whoever corrects a mocker invites insult, but who, whoever rebukes the wicked incurs abuse. Do not rebuke mockers or they will hate you. Rebuke the wise and they will love you. Instruct the wise and they will be wiser still. Teach the righteous and they will add to their learning. This is, this is the verse that I want to focus on the most. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For through wisdom your days will be many, and years will be added to your life. If you are wise, your wisdom will reward you. But if you are a mocker, you alone will suffer. Now what's interesting here is that Solomon is, is kind of drawing a line between two types of people. And he, he uses these words that sound insulting, but he doesn't really mean them that way. He says people who are simple and, and, and want to acquire knowledge, and people who are mockers. And the way mocker translates is not real accurate, but I'm going to tell you what he means by mocker. What he means by mocker is a phrase that we have in English called know-it-all. Anybody have any know-it-alls in their life? Yeah. Like... There are a few people that I detest as much in my life, probably even more than criminals, than know-it-alls. Like people who do not know how to say they're sorry, people who do not know how to say they're wrong, people who do not or are not willing to change their mind about anything, people who are not willing to listen to instruction, people who want to change everybody's mind on Facebook, People who always think they know better than everyone else, and everyone else is just a little dumber than they are, and they've got some sort of special access to the truth. Solomon says, that sort of person will never be wise. Because they don't want to hear wisdom. They want to hear what they want to hear. They already know the right answer, so why would they listen to you give them answers? They already know everything. Why would they read your post and consider it? Why would they consider an opposing point of view? Why would they consider someone with a different background? Because they already know. 
I don't even really need to describe this person in your life because I'm pretty sure you already have somebody in your mind, like right there. And you're like, I know exactly who you're talking about. And this is not exclusive to one side or the other. I've met many right people that are know-it-alls and many left people that are know-it-alls and many center people who are know-it-alls. It's amazing how know-it-allism is uh, an impressive part of our society. But what Solomon is saying is that there are people who are know-it-alls and then there's people who are willing to learn. There are people who are willing to listen. There are people who are willing to change their mind. There are people who are willing to sit at the feet of God and say, I don't know very much. I've always asked this question to people like, in the whole, in the whole of knowledge, in the whole universe, do you think that there's a greater percentage that you know or a greater percentage that you don't know? And that how people answer that question oftentimes tells me a lot about them. And there's some people that be like, I think I know pretty much everything. And there's people who say, I'm pretty sure I don't know very much. That second person's a lot more fun to hang out with, by the way. And, and, and they're probably going to listen a lot more. Like, like, when we understand how little we know, how, 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 how small our understanding is compared to God, that's when wisdom starts. We're not talking about knowledge. We're not talking about right answers. We're talking about wisdom. Wisdom is as much about the how as it is about the what. Wisdom is as much about how you communicate as it is what you communicate. Wisdom is as much about in emotional intelligence as it is about academic intelligence. Wisdom is about knowing when to speak and when to shut up. Wisdom is, is about understanding the world and, and, and understanding God and understanding other people in such a way that you put God first and other second and yourself last, always. And if you can't figure that out, I don't care how smart you are, you will never be wise. And this is the situation that we find ourselves here in this story. Wisdom sets the, sets the table with wine and meat and, and food and goes out to invite people. And she invites everybody, but the only people that show up are the people who are willing to learn. In fact, she prefers dumb people to smart people who can't close their mouth. Isn't it interesting? Like, like she would rather, wisdom would rather attract people who are not very intelligent and are open to learning and understand how imperfect they are. She would rather have them at the table than people who think they know it all. Those mockers. Because all the mockers want to do is spout their own opinion. So then we get to this idea of fear. What does fear mean in this context? Well, fear, it, as it says in this passage, fe the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And, and what that means is not that you are afraid of God. It means that you have reverence and awe and respect for God. When we talk about fear in the Bible, sometimes it means being scared. So like when Jesus is on the boat and the, and the waves are crashing and he says to his disciples, do not be afraid. He literally means do not be afraid. Like, like don't be scared of cats. But when we talk about fear of God, there is a healthy version of fear that allows us to understand God for who he truly is. It's basically a right ordering of things. Like, a fear of God helps you understand that God is so much smarter, so much wiser, so much bigger, and has such a better perspective than you will ever have. If you don't think that God has a better perspective than you've got, then you think you're God. And so a fear of God, a fear of the Lord, and the way they talk about it in the Old Testament, there's a little bit of like, yikes, you might get me. But honestly, like, that's not the worst thing, right? Like, I think sometimes we need a little bit of yikes, he might get me. Think about how you feared your parents, as long as you had good quality parents, okay? If you actually had parents that were abusive and, and didn't, didn't, you know didn't raise you well, then this is the, the fear is a whole separate question. But I'm talking about like healthy family Ooh. settings. If you had a healthy family setting, there's still a little bit of fear that you have of your parents. Because you know that they hold the reins over you going out on Saturday night. You know that they hold the reins over whether or not you can buy clothes at the mall. You, you, are, you are fearing them a little because you know they're smarter than you for most of your life until you become 13 for some reason. <laughs> and, and, and 
And you always know that there's something that there's something out there that your parents possess that you don't have until you leave the house and you have your own job and you set yourself up. You're always going to be a little bit less than them. And so, so you are scared, but you're also like trying to honor them and you're trying to build your life in such a way that they are not uh, that they're not put aside, but that they're they're part of the solution. And this is how we think about God. When we think about what, how do we, how do we honor and respect God for who He really is? What we're all we're really saying is, a correct fear of God is simply an acknowledgement of the way things already are. God is already bigger than you. God is already smarter than you. God is already more powerful than you. God is already more powerful than every one of us put together. Fear of the Lord is basically just an understanding that that's real. It's an acknowledgement that that's a real thing. And I think sometimes when we think about, think, go back to that picture that you had in your mind of God, sometimes the picture that we create of God in our minds is very weak. And very, like, honestly, kind of sad. You know, like, oh, look at him, he's cute. Let's give him a sandwich. Like, if your version of God is cute and needs a sandwich from you, like, that is not an accurate awe and respect of God. Like, this is somebody who, like, you know, created the world, created the universe. This is, this is somebody who is all-powerful, all-knowing. Like, if, if that's, if, if the kind of God you worship, the kind of God that's in your mind is a simpleton, is weak, is dumb, is not with the times, and it's just kind of cute and convenient. It's probably not a very accurate representation of God. My, uh, I have a cousin who lives in Laredo. Anybody from Laredo? Yeah, okay, no. Uh, so I'm not going to insult anyone from Laredo when I say this. My cousin lives in Laredo, and Laredo, let's just say, is not the number one tourist attraction in the United States. Especially at night. It's a little dangerous. A little dangerous. And so my cousin invested in two Doberman pinchers that he has in his yard. Now here's the thing about Doberman pinchers. Doberman pinchers can be really good dogs. Like they can be pretty friendly. Doberman pinchers can also rip your face off. Okay? And it's the latter one that he likes at night. And it's the former one that he likes during the day. Like he likes to be able to play with his dogs. But he also likes that when someone's walking up the street at night that maybe he's a little bit more dangerous and sees that he's got two Doberman pinchers in the yard, at the very least they'll rob the house next to him and not his. <laughs> and he's a trucker, so he's constantly on the road. So he, these are these are the, the dogs that kind of protect his house while he's gone. I, I kind of think that God is like a Doberman pincher. In the sense that, like, he's loving. He's loyal. He's amazing. But also, you don't want to cross him. Like, you don't want to step into things that you don't want to. And he's kind of always watching you with his eyes. And that, that should inspire not only, like, fear and respect, but it should also inspire us to be better people. It should inspire us to lay down our own passions and our, and, and our own convictions and our own sense of how smart we are, how beautiful we are, or how amazing the, the thoughts that we have are. It should convict us to lay those things down because we are part of something much bigger and much better than any of us by ourselves. So I, I'd encourage us as we think about what it means to have a right relationship with God. To think about, do you fear God? Like, I think our, our gut reaction is saying, no, no, I don't, I don't fear God. He's very nice. Like, you know, play cards, you know. He's like a, he's like a plush, one of those giant plush bunnies you get from Costco. You can lean on him, fall asleep, you know, fluff up his ears a little bit. I think that's a lot of times how we, we think we're supposed to think. But, but I also think like we need to realize that he's also all-powerful, and he's also in control of the universe, and he also has some opinions on how the world is supposed to work, and how people are supposed to treat each other, and about how he wants his creation to operate. And we should not be so free 
to insert our opinions when God is voicing His. You know that person, I've met this person a few times, that when you're having a conversation with them, you're telling them your point, and they were like already clearly contemplating their own point while you're talking and not listening to you? Yeah, I know this person because I am this person. Uh, so like, as, as, you're, as you're making a point, they're like, <laughs> as soon as they're done, as soon as they, as soon as they like, take a breath, I'm gonna nail them to the wall! And so I think that's how a lot of things like, God, that's nice, God, that's nice, God, that's nice. But! <laughs> I think that's how a lot of us are like, okay, God, you stop talking now? You want to hear the real plan? Here it is, I got it, I got it right here. What if we feared God in such a way that it, 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 it allowed us for a minute to think about how powerful and amazing God is supposed to be? But what if it also gave us the good sense to live out this, this life in a way that is honoring to other people? That is honoring to the creation. That is honoring to the way that we were created to be. What if the fear of God enabled us? Because it's not just us. We now instead of instead of you worrying about God being out to get you, what if you knew that God was at your back and He was with you? See, that's that's the way that Jesus changes the picture. He says, "You think God is out to get you." Take that same fear and knowledge of God about God being all-powerful and being out to get you and turn it on its head and say, what if an all-powerful, all-knowing God was behind me and empowering me and loving me and giving me something to do with my hands, giving me some words to speak with my mouth and giving me a, a, an opportunity, a platform to speak on His behalf? What if... I have the ability to speak and act and be for God in this world. I would be unstoppable. When God's on your side, you are unstoppable. You have that right now. That's not an if statement. That's a it is statement. God is on your side. God is at your back. God is to be feared because he is great and he is powerful and he is mighty. But God is on your side. God is at your back. Let's live with that knowledge and live with that power. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God who loves us so very much that you have never, never stopped loving us. That you have never stopped giving us uh, the strength that we need to live each day. So, Lord, as, as we think about what it means to follow you, as we think about um, how powerful and mighty you are, Lord, would you, and would you remind us that, that your grace, that your goodness, that your plan, it covers us and it gives us a blueprint for how to live following after you. Lord, for those of us who just imagine you as a cuddly bear, we, we, we pray that you would remind us of how big and powerful and mighty you are. How dangerous sometimes even you are. But Lord, also remind us of how having a God like that empowers us to be a people that don't have to live with fear. That we don't have to live fearing the same things that the world fears because we have that God on our side. And so Lord, would you remind us of your bigness, remind us of your power, and remind us that it is with us. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.